Good evening. I want to welcome each one of you out tonight. Um, if you would, go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of John. That's where we're going to spend a majority of our time tonight, the book of John. As we study tonight, I want you to really open up your Bibles, even though I have the verses up on the screen behind me, I want you to open up your Bibles and to observe for yourself what is being said in God's Word. I want you to think for yourself rather than just go with whatever I say. I want you to challenge what I'm saying tonight. Over the uh, last couple months, I've gone through a couple of different lessons. The first lesson was... Why do bad things happen to good people? And we talked about why all these tragedies happen in this world. Why is it we as Christians suffer in this world? And we came to the conclusion that it's because of our sin that we suffer, and that we speculated that maybe, just maybe, we suffer here so that we don't take for granted our true destiny, and that is heaven. We don't take for granted our true home heaven. And then we came to the next lesson that I did, Heaven Will Surely Be Worth It All. And in that lesson, we talked about how great heaven is going to be for those who are Christians. We talked about how great it's going to be, how there's going to be no, sin, or there's going to be no sorrow, no pain, no suffering anymore, how there's going to be no more darkness. And we talked about those things. And tonight I want to pick up on, the, on an idea, because it's going through so many, so many people's minds, Why is it we get heaven? Why is it we earn heaven? Why do we have that reward? You've already told us that it's because of our sin that we suffer here on earth, so why is it that we get this glorious place called heaven for all of eternity? And it's because of God's grace. And that's what I'll talk about tonight is God's grace. And we want to talk about what is God's grace. What is grace? And there are several different ideas behind grace, several different meanings behind grace. Um, Many of us have been raised to believe that God is good. Why is it that we believe this? We're not told, or we're told when we're kids, um, or when we first begin our walk as a Christian, and when we sing songs like, God is so good. Why is it we believe all this? Um, There's a lot of misconceptions when we talk about grace. Some people don't fully grasp the true meaning behind what grace is. Uh, Some people don't fully grasp what grace is offering. Many people don't don't understand who can receive grace, and others will dispute whether anything must be done to receive grace. So we need to understand what grace is as it is part of our foundation as a Christian. It is part of who we are as Christians. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1 beginning in verse 16. John chapter 1 beginning in verse 16. Verse 16 and 17 says, For of his fullness... We have all received, we have all received, and grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. We need to understand what grace is because it is part of who we are, and we all have received grace. Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 23. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. You who boast in the law, through your breaking of the law, do you dishonor God for the name of God, blaspheme? Sorry, that's chapter 2. Chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace, through the redemption which is Christ Jesus. We have all sinned, we all fall short of the glory of God, but yet... Christ's grace, Jesus' grace, God's grace is what brings us to redemption. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 8. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not as a result of works that no one should boast. So we don't work for grace. It's not us that does all the work for grace. 
It is through God's gift that we get grace. Grace is an important part of our belief, and we need to understand what it truly is. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. So how would men, or how would you define grace? Let's think about that. How do we define grace in today's society? Uh, Many people may know this acronym, uh, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's how many have described what grace is. And although it's a good basic concept of what grace is, it doesn't explain what grace is. It doesn't explain what the riches are. It doesn't explain what the expense was. And was Christ the only one who paid for it? And what's my part in all of this? What's my part in this grace? And how do I get access to God's grace? Uh, Some men we see have uh, come up with definitions. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, The goodness or love of God towards those who do not in any way deserve it, it is unmerited goodness or love of God towards those who have forfeited everything, or who have forfeited every claim upon him and his love, and who deserve judgment and condemnation. That's what he says grace is. Then you have others like Mr. Packer, It is God showing goodness to a person who deserves only severity and has no reason to expect anything but severity. A man like Farrell Jenkins says that grace is, the word grace means undeserved or unmerited favor. Grace is the opposite of merit. And then Chad Shizik says, grace is everything that God does for us through Christ, and we cannot do it for ourselves. Although all these definitions are good definitions, they don't explain everything. No short definition can give us this full concept of what grace truly is. No short definition gives us a full knowledge of what grace is, so let us allow God to give us this definition of what grace is. What does God say? His definition of God or of grace is. And I think God defines grace in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. Very familiar verse to all. I bet many of you know it, if not all of you know it by heart. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, his only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Although this verse right here does not use the word grace, I think it gives this perfect definition of what grace is. It starts off by giving us the origin of grace, where it comes from. It is God who gives us this grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. Look at Psalm chapter 104, verse 31. Psalm chapter 104, verse 31. Verse 31 says, Let the glory of the Lord endure forever. Let the Lord be glad in His works. In that previous lesson, that first lesson that I did on why do bad things happen to good people, we said it's because of sin. The psalmist right here says that God should find glory, that He may rejoice in His works. But yet today we find so many... That God can't say that about. He can't rejoice in his works. He began in Genesis chapter 1 saying, everything I created was good. God saw and it was good. But yet we, as human beings, have corrupted that. We have sinned and caused God to look down upon us in shame. But he is the one that we rejected. He didn't reject us. Look at Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. Verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, neither is his... Neither is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. 
We are the ones that cause God to look away from us. God doesn't just look away from us for no reason. God doesn't just turn his face from us. God doesn't just turn his ear away from the prayers of the ones who truly believe in him. It is because of our sins and our iniquities that God would do that. If we haven't truly repented of those. Look at Hosea chapter 8 and verse 3. Hosea chapter 8 and verse 3. Hosea 8, verse 3. Israel has rejected the good. The enemy will pursue him. So we see even back in that time that those people back then rejected God. They turned away from him. And then Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculation, and their foolish hearts was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the, cor- of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of a corruptible man, and of birds, and of four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Brethren, we do that today. We do the same thing that these Christians right here in Rome are doing. We have our own idols today. Even though they might not be the ones that are mentioned right here, we have our own idols. And we turn our face from God. Only God has what we need in order to receive grace, in order for our sins to be forgiven. He is the only one who can judge righteously and punish those who need to be punished. He is the only one who could judge righteous and punishing all. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. Romans 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, all unrighteousness of men who suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. We have sinned against God. And he has all authority to punish us in whichever way he sees fitting. God is this origin of grace. John 3.16 gives us the motive. John 3.16 says, For it was love that God sent his Son. Psalm chapter 89. Psalm chapter 89. Psalm 89, verse 14. Verse 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of thy throne. Loving kindness and truth go before thee. And then 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. And that's exactly, brethren, what God is. God is love. God's love is what gives us this grace. That is the motive that he gives us in John 3, verse 16. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Romans 5 and verse 8. Romans 5, verse 8 says... But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates his love because he sent his son to die for us. God demonstrates his love through that sacrifice that he was so willing to give for us. And he loved us even when we were his enemies. Even when we turned our backs on him. Even when Jesus had no one else to go to, when he was hanging there on the cross. God still loved us. Romans, or John chapter 3 and verse 16 tells us the recipients of this grace. Who's going to receive all this grace? Who is it that receives God's grace? And it tells us the world. The world receives God's grace. 
A world that lived in rejection of him is capable of receiving God's grace. And yet we continue to reject him. Look at John chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. John 1, verses 9 through 11. John 1, beginning in verse 9. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was, made, he was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. The world can receive grace. Now, Calvinists believe that Jesus died only for those who had this pre-atonement, who were given this limited atonement, that, God, or that Christ only died for those select few. And they point to passages like John chapter 10 and verse 15. If you would turn over there, John 10 and verse 15. John 10 verse 15. Even as my Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, Calvinists want to point to that and say that Jesus only laid his life down for the sheep. When John 3.16 says, God gave his only begotten Son for the whole world. So how do we explain this? They're going to argue that Christ died only for those saved. And they use that passage there in John 15. And the arguments made on this passage is that Jesus died for his sheep. And Calvinists take that to mean only the elect few. And the answer to that argument is there in verse 16. Look at verse 16. And I have other sheep which are, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they shall hear my voice. And they shall become one flock with one shepherd. Christ has others that he has to bring into this fold. He has other sheep. And also they try to use this world world as sort of a meaning for sinners. But it's always best to let the scriptures define what it means by the words. So if you would open up your Bibles to John chapter 1 and verse 9. Actually, sorry, John chapter 3 verse 17. John chapter 3 beginning in verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world that he might condemn this world, but that the world might be saved through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and the only God, or the one and the only Son of God. This then is the judgment, the light. This then is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. God loves all of us. He loves the entire world. And Jesus died for the entire world, but not all of the world would come to the light. Not all of the world comes to Christ. John 3.16 gives us the cost. What was paid for this grace? It was the giving of God's Son, His one and only Son. God gave His Son to suffer like none other. The Son that was in His bosom that we read about in John chapter 1 and verse 18. The one whom He is well pleased in that we read about in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5. Matthew 17, verse 5, While he was speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God gave him up for us, for sinners. And God's truly a God of grace. God is truly that God of grace. Look at 1 Peter 5 and verse 10. 1 Peter 5 and verse 10.
1 Peter 5, verse 10 says, And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, and strengthen, and establish you. God is a God of grace. John 3.16 gives us the purpose. And that purpose was so that we'll not all perish, but have everlasting life. Look at John chapter 1 and verse 1. John 1 and verse 1. John 1 verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and life was the light of men. Christ came to give us life. And that life reflects this light, this light of hope, this light of God's glory. And that's what is important, is that life that was in him. Eternal life is in Jesus because he is the sustainer. Look at John chapter 4, verse 10. John 4, verse 10. John chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you the living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with you, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than your father Jacob, and you who gave us the well and drank of it himself, and his sons and his cattle. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him as a well of water, springing up an eternal life. The life that Christ gives is eternal. John chapter 6, verse 35. John chapter 6, verse 35. Verse 35 says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall thirst, me shall never thirst. Verse 48 through 51. I am the bread of life. Your father ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread also which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Christ died so that we may have life, and he is that sustainer of that life. Eternal life in Jesus is because he is the shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 7 through 11. John 10, verses 7 through 11. Jesus therefore said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me, thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thieves come, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. Christ lays down his life for us, even though we have sinned, even though we have destroyed everything that he created and God has looked away from it with shame. Eternal life in Jesus is because in him, is life. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 25. John 6, verses 25 through 29. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. 
Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give to you. For, for on him the Father, even God, has set, has set his seal. They said therefore to him, What shall we do? And we may work the works of God. Jesus said, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. And then skipping to chapter 11, verse 25. John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe in this? Eternal life is in Jesus because in Him is access to the Father. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe and also believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not, so I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am. There you may be also. And you know the way that where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to, the, comes to the Father but through me. The only way we get access to Father, the only way we get access to heaven, the only way we get to stand there next to Jesus there in heaven is through Christ. So in conclusion, believe and do what's necessary. John 3.16 ends and says, everyone who believes in Him are going to be the ones who receive that. Everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, verses 18 through 21 is a good way to conclude this. John chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light is come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. <clears throat> the grace that God, bring, that God offers tonight is the grace that's not going to bring wealth. It's not going to bring fame. It also is not going to save your loved ones from sickness or death. This grace that Christ, that God offers, is going to bring you Spiritual wealth. It's going to bring you spiritual happiness, spiritual freedom from pain and from sickness. And the only way to do that is anyone who lives by the truth and comes to the light. The only way we can receive that gift of eternal life is to come to Him, believe in Him, and go to the light. But in order for us to receive this grace in John 3.16... It's got to be for those who believe as well. God's love's unconditional and it's for all. That last uh, definition that we gave, grace does for you what you cannot do. Never what you're unwilling to do. That is what we're here to do. That's what God sent His Son to do, is to give you life. Because we're not capable of doing it on our own. We're not capable of getting to heaven on our own without that sacrifice that is Christ. That is why He died for us. That is why heaven will surely be worth it all. That is why we give up the worldly pleasures. That is why we suffer here on this earth so that we can see heaven. 
so that we can be there with Christ, so that we will be in that place of no more sorrow, no more sickness, and no more death. But you have to take your part. Each and every one of you have to take your part and stand against the pleasures of this world. Abstain from sin and come to Christ. Follow in that light that He offers. If there is anything that we can do for you tonight to assist you in that, then tonight's to do it. Tonight's the night that you need to make that change. Because you don't know when that last time on earth is going to be. You don't know when your last day on earth is going to be. Don't let it be too late. Don't let you sitting here in this pew contemplating whether you should come forward or not hinder you from being in heaven. If there's anything that we can do for you tonight, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.